Amen. I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. As we close out this teaching series titled Jacob. This is the final message in this teaching series titled Jacob. Genesis chapter 35. In Genesis chapter 34, what we read through, studied, dissected, and applied last week. Genesis chapter 34, it is a godless chapter. We don't find the the name of God present in chapter 4, nor do we find God involved in any of the activities in chapter 34. It is indeed a tragic chapter. It's a tragic chapter. It's a godless chapter. In chapter 35, chapter 35, it is a God-filled chapter. Can we say amen for that? It's a God-filled chapter. 22 times we find the name of God mentioned in chapter 35. And I hope that you will look through, circle, highlight, underline on your own. And don't just take my word for it. 22 times we find the name of God. 15 of those 22, it's it's literally the, the, the name or reference God, he, him. Seven times we find the word Bethel, which is house of God, the house of God, 22 times. So 34, chapter 34 is a, is a godless chapter. And praise be to God that chapter 35 is a God-filled chapter. Look at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 35. God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Today, I want us to to look at what God is instructing Jacob to do. I, I want us to consider this. Get up, because you serve the God of second chances. I don't know who I'm talking to in the house or online that perhaps you, you're laying down, you're holding back because you, you're, you're saying to yourself or the lies of the enemy have gotten to you that you're not good enough or you've made too many mistakes or your life is a mess and what can God do? What can God do? How can he take this life, this this mess, and and do a a miracle in the mess? Well, praise God, that's what our God does. (laughs) That's your story. That's my story. That that is our story. That Somehow he takes the, the sin and the mess and the failures, and he turns it into something beautiful as we surrender it all over to him. And, and that's the story of Jacob. Jacob has been on the run for some 20 years, some 20 years. And God comes to him in verse 1, and what does he say? Get up. Go to Bethel. Settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Look at verse 2. So Jacob said to his family, And all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. Then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings. And Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. So Jacob said to his family, if you read back through chapter four, you won't find Jacob saying anything. We don't have any evidence of Jacob saying anything. His sons are the ones speaking in chapter 34. And so thankfully, after this encounter with the Lord and the Lord saying, get up and go to Bethel, what does he say? He tells his family to get rid of all the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. Jacob has been silent in chapter 34, but he's no longer silent in chapter 35. Some of you might be thinking, I don't know that I can get up and I don't know that I can move on. And so how do I do it? I'm 
I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad you're considering this question. How do you get up and move on? Well, we see it's very clear in verse 2. Do you see in verse 2? How, how do you get up and move on? You get rid of anything that's hindering you. Anything that's holding you back, you, you remove it. You get rid of anything that is hindering you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Would you write that reference down? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of, of God. How do we run this race with endurance? How do we finish well? It starts by laying aside every hindrance, every distraction, anything that has taken the place of God. We, we, we remove it. We, we lay it down. And then what? We put our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes. But before we fix our eyes, we must fix our, our heart. And I wonder today, would you take a personal account is there anything or anyone that has taken the place of God in your life? Is there anything or anyone that's taken the number one place in your life? And today, what an opportunity today to surrender it over to him. To lay it aside. To get rid of it so that you can finish this race that God has set you on well. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author of Hebrews says. What a reminder. Some just need that reminder today. Maybe you're, you're a little distracted lately. Uh, maybe your eyes are catching other things. But today it's the encouragement to put your eyes and keep them on Jesus as you run this race with endurance. And so Jacob has this encounter with the Lord. And he tells his family and the people that are with him to get rid of anything, any, any foreign gods, any hindrances, and to purify yourself. And so what do they do as response? We, we see it clearly in verse four. They, they gave Jacob all foreign gods and, and even their earrings, their, even, their, even their earrings. Ladies, get ready to give up some things today. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm joking. <laughs> Oh, but, but why? You got you to consider this. Like, how crazy is that? You know, I understand the foreign gods, but, 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 but in this day and age, historically, these, these outer uh, 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 garments or adornments uh, represented the things of the, the world. Uh, the things of the world that, it, that, that would take one's worship off of the one who created everything. And today it would be a good question to ask, is there anything in my life that's taken my worship away from him? Is there anything that's taken my eyes off of him? Is there anything that's distracting my heart today that's removing him as the one? What needs to be purified in my life? What needs to be purified in my life? Isaiah chapter 48, would you write this reference down? Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10. Look this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the children of Israel. Look, look, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Verse 11, I will act for my own sake, indeed my own. For how can I be defiled? I will not give my glory to another. Listen to me, Jacob and Israel. The one called by me. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. We just sing about this. Holy. There is no one, no one like you. And God today is he's calling us. He's calling. He wants your heart. He wants your uh, focus. He wants your attention. And so what would you take time today to consider this very moment? What needs to, what in my life is, is hindering me, holding me back? What, what do I need to release? Lord, purify me. 
of anything, remove anything that is not honoring to your name. I will not give my glory to another, the Lord says. He calls them to purify, to purify. This purification is mentioned throughout the scriptures of precious stones, silver and gold. And it's a beautiful process. Oftentimes we don't consider as we look at the jewelry that we might wear, we don't consider the process that it goes through to be beautiful. But, but this, with extreme heat, with silver and gold, all the impurities rise in this purification process. It rises. And I wonder what, what do we need to go through? What in our life needs to be purified, needs to be released, needs to be removed so that we live lives that honor the Lord our God. The first step in reestablishing intimacy with God is to get rid of all the other gods. I wonder today if you might be thinking, well, I just don't hear God as, as closely. I'm just not feeling it. And I, I hear this often, this, this kind of language often. And, and, and so the question is why? God hasn't moved. God said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. Uh, what, what often happens is we allow other things and other people to come in and, and take precedence over the Lord, our God. And so today, if that's your heart's desire to reestablish this intimacy, would you consider what, what things or what people you've allowed to take the place of God in your life? Look at verse 5. Genesis chapter 35, when they set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to lose, that is Bethel in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Don't miss verse 5. It's easy to miss it in what's happening here in chapter 35. But don't miss how our God works oftentimes behind the scenes. Like we don't even know it. We don't even see it. We can't even fathom it. But this is who our God is. That's why he's great and worthy to be praised. Amen? Did you see it in verse 5? When they set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. Jacob was scared to death at the close of chapter 34 that all these people were going to rise up against him. He, he turns what was such a tragedy into a self-pity party. Look what you've done, my sons. You've caused trouble on me. He was scared to death that all these people were going to rise up but what does God do in, in verse 5, chapter 35? He sends a terror out to protect him. What do we read in chapter 28? Do you remember, remember chapter 28 when Jacob first had this encounter with God? He, 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 he runs uh, uh, himself where, where he's worn out and he arrives in ancient Luz and he goes to sleep and he has this dream and God speaks to him in this dream, and God promises, God promises his presence, God promises his provision, but God also promises his protection. Do you remember that? In chapter 28, God promises his protection. Jacob is scared to death that these people are going to rise up and come after him and his family. But what does God do? God does what he has always done. He is true to his promise. He sends out a terror over all these people so that they don't rise up and come after him. God keeps his promise. Look at verse 9. God appeared to Jacob again. After he returned from Padan Aram and he blessed him. Did you see that? God appeared to Jacob again. Again, God, I don't want you to miss this. God appeared to Jacob again. Church, this is after Jacob allowed his sons to kill all the, all the men of Shechem and plunder the city. God appeared to Jacob again. 
This is after Jacob disobeyed God. And rather than going straight to Bethel, what does he do? He, he sets up their tents in, in Sukkoth outside of Bethel, instead of Bethel. And God appeared to Jacob. God appears to Jacob again. This is, this is after Jacob feared for his life. When he looked up and he saw Esau coming with his 400 men in chapter 33. But yet God uh, appears to Jacob again. This is after Jacob wrestles with God in chapter 32. But what does God do? He appears to Jacob again. This is after Jacob has been angry and afraid of Laban. This is after Jacob had deceived Laban and his sons and he flees in chapter 31. And what does God do? He appears to Jacob again. This is after Jacob has been running for 20 years. He's been running. He's been away from the land of promise. And what does God do? He appears to Jacob again. And I wonder today, can anyone identify with Jacob? Can anyone identify with Jacob? Can, can anyone put their hands together and praise our great God that he loves us despite of our sin? That he loves us despite of our disobedience. That he loves us despite of our failures and our mistakes. Church, listen, it's, it's time to get up because you serve the God of second chances. We serve the God of second chances. God appeared to Jacob again. Look at the verse 10. Verse 10, God said to him, your, your name is Jacob. You will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. Jacob is wrestling with God. God dislocates his hip. And God tells him this. I'm going to change your name. And what does God say again? Hey, are you ready? You've been Jacob, but no longer are you Jacob. You're a new, you're a new man. You're a new man. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Would you write that reference down? It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. The old has passed and see the new has come. Again, there might be some today in the house online that might be thinking, but Tim, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. There are lives that I will take to the grave, but I can tell you today that there is one who knows all things, and despite of all those things, he still sent his one and only son, Jesus, and Jesus really walked this earth over 2,000 years ago, and Jesus really went to the cross, despising the shame. Jesus went to the cross, and his blood really shed from the cross, and he was placed in a grave, a borrowed tomb, and he rose victorious on that third day. Why? Out of unconditional love for me, for you, for the world. And church, the message today is quite clear. Get up because we serve the God of second chances. I want you to hear clearly today that it's never too late to do the wrong thing. Some of you might be thinking, ah, it's too late. I've gone too far. Some of you might be thinking, I'm too, too old. Too much time has passed. No, no, no. It's never too late and you're never too old. We serve the God of second chances. Jacob, in this context, is 100 years old. Let that sink in for a moment. Let that sink in just for a moment. 100 years old. It's never too late. You're never too old. Verse 11. Verse 11, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation indeed, an assembly of nations will come from you and kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac and I will give the land to your future descendants. Do, do you hear what God promises Jacob? And so today, if, if you're ready to get up and move on, if you're ready to give up because we serve the God of second chances, I want to be very clear. 
You're not getting up and moving on on your own strength. We must rely on the one who is almighty. It's not you, it's not me. There's only one. And his name is the Lord our God. First Chronicles 29 says this, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Verse 12, riches and honor come from you and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Psalm 91, one says, the one who lives under the protection of the most high dwells, dwells in the shadow of the almighty. Jeremiah 32 verse 26 says this, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, look, I am the Lord, the God over every creature. Is anything too difficult for me? Revelation 1 8 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. All throughout Scripture, what do we find? Evidence after evidence after evidence that there's only one who's worthy, and we must rely on Him. We must rely on Him. But perhaps the last time you got up and tried to move on, you, 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 you fell flat on your face because you were relying on yourself. It's possible. But today is a new day. Scripture tells us that his mercies are new each day. Would you rely on the one who is almighty? Look at verse 13. Then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. So Jacob has this encounter with the Lord. And he sets up this marker to remember the encounter with the Lord and to worship the Lord at this place. Like Jacob's offering, our life should be an offering poured out to the Lord. When people see us, what are they seeing? The psalmist declared, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do they see that in the church? That the Lord is good. Verse 15, Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Listen, faith can be found by revisiting the place where we first met God. I wonder when the last time you reflected on that moment that you met the Savior. That moment that your life was radically changed because you received the grace that it was offered to you. You realize that you were a sinner and there's only one Savior that, that, that you couldn't save yourself. Faith can be found by revisiting the place where we first met God. It was this very place that in chapter 28, Jacob encounters the Lord. And he set up a marker then. And 20 years later, he makes his way back. Don't miss what's happening here. The Lord makes this promise. We read it quickly, but I don't want you to miss it. The Lord said this. I am God Almighty, verse 11. Be fruitful, multiply. A nation indeed, an assembly of nations will come from you. And kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, and I will give the land to your future descendants. What, what's happening here? What's happening is as we open up the first gospel of the New Testament, Matthew, and we read through this genealogy, what we find is the promise of God, the promises of God are true. That what he speaks will come to fruition. This promise right here, that the Savior would come through this line, is what we discover as we read through Matthew chapter 1. 
Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, and then you can go down the list until we come to Jesus, the Messiah, is born through this line. Today, I wonder what your next step would be. I wonder what do you need to get rid of that is, that is hindering you from getting up and moving on? What's hindering you from getting up and moving on? And would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place and those that are joining us online. I wonder what's hindering you from getting up and moving on. Some 20 years, Jacob has been on the run, away from the land of promise. But finally, he walks through obedience and he's back at that place of Bethel, the house of God. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 15. Jesus is sharing a parable. It's a mini story with a big meaning. And he shares this story for those that are listening that day and and it's the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. The father had two sons and he gave his inheritance to both of them. And one went away and squandered all of the inheritance. And he finds himself in a pig pen. He finds himself at the, the lowest point of his life. And it's at that moment, that tragic moment, that he comes to his senses. And he's wondering, if I return home, will my father welcome me back? Will my father welcome me back? And so he makes his way back home. And as he sees home, he sees his father running to him with his arms open wide. What a moment. Today, today maybe you've run. Maybe you spent years running maybe you've been holding back different lies of the enemy and today the message is quite simple get up because we serve the God of second chances only one that can forgive us of all of our sins and give us a future. And so as people are praying all over this place, I wonder if there's one here that's never surrendered their life over to Jesus. You're wondering, where does it start? Where do I start? Where do I start? It starts with faith. It starts with believing that Jesus came to this earth over 2,000 years ago that he died on a cross, that he was placed in a grave, and he rose on that third day. And the question is, will you receive the grace of God that's been made available because Jesus is alive? That's your prayer all across this place, those online with me. Would you call upon the name of the Lord? Would you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, save me. I trust in you. I'm a sinner. You are the Savior. I believe in you. Starting this day, you are Lord of my life. You are boss of my life. Have your way. Have your way. This life is yours. I trust you.